Welcome back. Our Kelly File special continues now with the story of Dr. Kanta Ahmed. Like I on her CLE and Dr. Jasser, she too thinks there is a dramatic threat from radical Islam and once actually sat with a terror expert to review jihadists' videos of decapitations, what she called a pivotal experience. But unlike our other guests, she has a different approach for addressing this issue. We'll speak with her in a moment, but first, more on her story. Dr. Kanta Ahmed was born in London, raised in the Islamic faith. I'm a granddaughter of Muslims born in, uh, in India. She earned her medical degree at the University of Nottingham. She took a job practicing and teaching medicine in a country she thought she understood, Saudi Arabia. It was while Kanta was there that the attacks of September 11th happened. She was stunned by the reaction of some colleagues and fellow Muslims who did not share her feelings of horror at the loss of innocent life. In 2010, Dr. Ahmed moved to New York City to continue her medical career. And then another turning point. For the first time, she saw recruitment videos of child jihadists ritualistically killing adults in the name of Islam. Kanta traveled to her parents' homeland, Pakistan, visiting a school that rehabilitated children who were brainwashed by Islamists. In 2012, she testified before the House Homeland Security Committee on radical Islam in the United States. Islamism is a political ideology with totalitarian missions. Dr. Kanta Ahmed joins me now. She is author of In the Land of Invisible Women. What a great title, Doctor. Good, good to see you tonight. In the Land of Invisible Women is right because that is one issue we have yet to fully explore. And that is something that drove Ayan to have the views that she has. And that is something you share with her, the treatment of women and how abhorrent it is in some factions of Islam. Yes, Megan, and thanks for tracking me down here in Jerusalem, where actually I'm participating in uh, talks uh, to combat anti-Semitism, which is a central belief in political Islamism. I have all the privileges that you've just mentioned, international travel, education, freedom of movement, ability to hold wealth, because of the Islam my parents gave me. And yet all of those privileges are contracted under Islamism. Much of what Ayan speaks about is absolutely uh, rings true when it comes to political Islamism. And she's careful to point out this is not the sum of Islam. Gender apartheid is one uh, manifestation of that. Virulent Islamist anti-Semitism is another very threatening. And making anything other, including myself or other members uh, who are participating in this important piece, because we are non-Islamists, we are also deemed infidel. This is absolutely anathema to what I understand to be Islam. Even in doing this special, there will be people who come out and say the whole thing, even discussing this, is somehow Islamophobic. It's like you cannot discuss the Islamicist faction of Islam without being accused of Islamophobia. You're absolutely right, Megan, and you've led the discussion on The Kelly File. We've talked together about Honor Diaries, the documentary that I participated with Ayan, and I have been accused, not just uh, in media, but also in person at Rutgers University of being an Islamophobe for raising this. This is a bold attempt by Islamists to shut down critical scrutiny of them. Mm -hmm. Islam is robust. It's, an, it's a faith that's persisted for 14 centuries. It can withstand criticism. It can withstand all kinds of slander. It can withstand cartoons being drawn about it. But Islamism is fragile. You scrutinize it and it crumbles. So Islamism is a useful word. And yes, I combat it. And it does inspire decapitations that were so rare. I needed to see them with a terror expert five years ago. Now they're everyday commonplace on Twitter if you want to look at what I am. Islamic State is doing. At what point does uh, it, being a Muslim, being a, a follower of Islam, convert, tr you know, transfer over into Islamicism? So great question. And in fact, Ayan uh, explained it very clearly. The inability to think critically and a basic tool is to be able to decide what is moral and what is consistent with the large overarching ideals of Islam. So you take out critical thinking, you take out faith literacy, and you can indoctrinate armies of children and youth that this is Islam when actually it's bold political totalitarian ideology with very violent intent. You teach armies of children your benefit if you 
commit homicide and also lose your life in the process. They have no ability to distinguish that. They will do it readily. It's basically what is what is written is written. What what you know the the radicals believe they believe, but the difference is modernity, reason, and critical thinking. And we're going to pick up on that point still ahead because as I stand you by, Doctor, thank you. Uh,